Right. Hi. Uh, we are now in session two of our overview of the Old Testament. Uh, last session, we did on the, the background, the uh, historical background of the Old Testament, the events, so historical events that would be, uh, that was very pertinent to the writing, the shaping of the Old Testament. And this morning, we want to take a look at the shape of the Old Testament itself. All right. Uh, the last time we talked about what are the historical historical events that shape it. This time we'll talk about the shape of the Old Testament. All right. If I can get this to work. So the traditional ideas, let's talk about a little bit of, about authorship. The traditional ideas of who wrote um, uh, the books of the Old Testament, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which in Hebrew we call it Torah, or in Greek we call it Pentateuch. Uh, Moses would be the traditional author of these five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And Joshua, of course, would write the book of Joshua. Uh, Samuel would be um, credited for the writing of Judges, Ruth, and the book of Samuel. That means first Samuel and second Samuel. But you say that, wait a minute, didn't Samuel die by, uh, in, the, uh, in the middle of uh, first Samuel? Uh, and the answer is yes. So plus Nathan and Gad perhaps uh, were responsible for writing the books of Judges, Ruth, and Samuel. And Jeremiah wrote Kings, uh, Jeremiah and Lamentation. David wrote most of the Psalms, as the superscripts in the Psalms would tell you, a Psalm of David. Solomon wrote most of the Proverbs, uh, and then he also wrote Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs. Ezra wrote Ezra Nehemiah and the Chronicles, and various prophets wrote the eponymous books. Uh, Isaiah wrote Isaiah, Jer uh, uh, and uh, Ezekiel wrote Ezekiel, and so on and so forth, right? So that would be the uh, traditional attribution of authorship to its various uh, authors. Um, you are writing? Where are you at? <laughs> Where are you at? Do you want me to send you, just send you the slides? Would that be, would that be great? I'll just send you the slides. Yeah, I'll just send you the slides, right? So, uh, but then there are some things, even those who recognize those who hold to the traditional view of authorship would recognize that there are some things we call post mosaica that means written after Moses all right uh, so Moses is attributed with Genesis Exodus Leviticus numbers and Deuteronomy but uh, it is still widely um, uh, acknowledged that there are stuff in those books that dates after Moses the most obvious of which is Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 34. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, a sentence that is very unlikely to have been written by, uh, to have been written by, I'm sorry, what happens? All right, to have been written by Moses, but no one knows in the present tense, <laughs> no one knows uh, the place of his burial to this day. Now, this day must be some days after Moses have died. And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Hard, for, hard to imagine how Moses could have written this. Um, <laughs> then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended after 30 days. Uh, Deuteronomy 34, verse 9 to 10 follows Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the people of Israel obeyed him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses. Now, uh, so the traditional uh, view would be, well, this part must have been written by Joshua then, right? So, uh Moses wrote much of Deuteronomy and then uh, Joshua writes the final paragraph uh, as an epilogue to, the, to, to Moses' career. But if you look at that last, 
line there, and there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses. And if Joshua is a successor of Moses, then Joshua is basically saying that, you know, I'm not as good as Moses. That, that's about all it would mean, right? But it does seem that for, for this last sentence, there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses would suggest that it's written a, a bit way after, way after, isn't it? And given the time scale of, if you say Malaysia, there hasn't been a prime minister as good as such and such and such, well, that may be just say 50, 60 years. Uh, that was the time scale of Malaysia, it's 50, 50 years. But if you're talking about the time scale of Israel, uh, for something to be, and uh, there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel, like Moses, that seems to be, well, a bit later than, than just immediately uh, after Joshua's death or something like that, right? Uh, there are other things that are that are obviously post mosaica. This is Genesis eleven verse thirty one. Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran his grandson and Sarai his daughter in law his son Abram's wife and they went together. They went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. So what in this would scholars ascribe to post mosaica will be Ur of the Chaldeans. Now Ur dates back a long time, but Chaldea not that long ago. Uh, if we say Penang of Malaysia, well, P Malaysia could be more recent, all right? but Penang would have dated a bit further back or Malacca or something like that. So uh, here is a encyclopedia.com, so this is legitimate, right? <laughs> Historian stuff. Uh, encyclopedia.com, Chaldea, an ancient country in what is now southern Iraq, inhabited by the Chaldeans, an ancient people who lived in Chaldea circa 800 BC. That is about a couple of hundred years after David. Okay, David is 1000 BC. This is 800 BC. And root Babylonia, from 625 to 539 BC, this is like um, Nebuchadnezzar, right? Era, exile era, exile 587. So they were renowned as astronomers and astrologers. The name, com the name comes from Chaldea, from Akkadian Kaud, the name of the Babylonian tribal group. So the fact that it's, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, which means the earliest the phrase Ur of the Chaldeans could have appeared would be 200 years after David, but that would be a bit um, obscure, right? There would have been an obscure people at 800 BC in a faraway southern Iraq. Uh, for them to be like Ur of the Chaldeans, for everyone to understand what that is, uh, it would have been at least a bit more prominent than from its humble beginnings. So uh, when did it become prominent? Right before or during the exile. All right. So uh, the phrase Ur uh, of the Chaldeans uh, is said to be post mosaica and would have to date to the time of the exile or something like that would be the time that makes the most sense. Now, of course, you can say, well, maybe what happened is that um, the uh, Moses wrote all this Okay, and this will be Ur of whatever else it would have been. Okay, Ur of the Mesopotamian uh, civilization during Moses' time. And then during the exile, uh, nobody could remember that old Sri Vijaya <laughs> anymore. Okay, and so uh, Majapahit or whatever, nobody can remember that anymore. And so uh, instead of saying Ur of, uh, of the um, uh, Sri Vijaya or whatever, then Ur of the Chaldeans, then that would be a minor update. That is entirely uh, possible. But you have to think, what would be the more likely uh, scenario uh, of the two? Another post mosaic would be here, Genesis 14 verse 14. When Abram heard that his kinsman had been taken captive, he let forth his trained men 
born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Right? Went in pursuit as far as Dan. Now, this is the Dan that Joshua thought, all right, they would conquer. Now, Moses would have, doesn't have this map, I suppose, all right? Uh, he sent in the, 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 ten, the 12 spies, all right, to spell the land, to... Um, and then Joshua allocated the land in the book of Joshua. Dan is allocated here, all right? Prime central piece of real estate, okay? Uh, but they failed to, to kick out the, the Canaanites here, right? And as a result, they had to find a new homeland. And uh, we can read this in the, in, the, in the last few chapters of uh, the book of Judges. They went up north to Laish. This city was called Laish, and they conquered that city, a defenseless city, and they renamed it Dan. So Dan wasn't even originally supposed to be here, right? Dan was originally supposed to be here. And, uh, and uh, they failed to take this piece of land. So they went to the border town, right? This is almost outside of the Holy Land, right? It's, it's, a, it's a border town. It's a border town. So, uh, for the phrase, went in pursuit as far as far as Dan, couldn't have been here, all right? All right? That is not as far as Kuala Lumpur. That makes no sense. As far as Perlis, now that makes sense, right? And pursuit, the police pursued him. So imagine, right? Criminals running away, heading towards the Thailand border, all right? And the police pursued him, pursued them as far as police. What does it mean? It means that almost, all right, just a little bit more, and they would have been outside of Malaysia, would have succeeded in escaping uh, the police, right? So Abraham heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive at his lot. He chased them, pursued as far as then. Lot was almost lost, all right? was almost taken out of the promised land. And right at the brink of it, right, Abram brought him back. That is the theological point. Lord almost got exiled. And this is the exiled route to Babylon. <laughs> Who was he taken captive by? The king of Shina. What is the king of Shina? That's Babel, Babylon. All right. So uh, the king of Shina, that is the king of Babylon, would have taken... Lot into exile to Babel. And uh, Abraham brought him back. He, because of his disobedience, he was almost, but almost got exiled. But if as long as there's a faithful Abraham, we can always bring him back. So that would be a great explanation for how did we even end up in exile is that we didn't have anyone faithful. <laughs> like Abraham, a representative of God to bring us back. Right now, of course, maybe it could have been and went in pursuit as far as Laish, but and then ah, Laish that's such an old name, right? So let's let's update the name to Dan. That is entirely possible, but again, uh, you you we must think Laish is in the Bible, uh, in the book of Judges. Is there a reason? Not to say Laish when the readers of the Bible would have known Laish is then because it is given uh, that they conquered Laish and renamed the place then. So these are some of the post mosaic uh, um, editorial work <laughs> that you can say to the um, book of Genesis. Apart from post mosaic, some things are also called. A mosaica. What's the difference between post mosaica and a mosaica? Post mosaica is that things that we are quite certain are written after Moses. A mosaica, we cannot say that it is written after the time of Moses, but it will be very difficult to accept if Moses wrote it. For example, Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. Now, the man Moses was very humble more than all people who are on the face of the earth. I think it's quite difficult for the most humble man in all, on the face of the earth to even hand this sentence. 
How did you know? How did you know you were the most humble man in all the earth? <laughs> you most humble man of all the earth? <laughs> Can you, you, anyone of you able to write this sentence down? <laughs> All right, writing your name in the third person is the most humble man, uh, more than all people who are on the face of the earth. Wow, wow, guys, I'm Donald Trump stump. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think only Donald Trump is capable of saying something like that. I'm the most humble man in the earth. <laughs> all right, um, Numbers 21, verses 14 to 15. Therefore, it is said in the book of the walls of the Lord, what well, have in Sufa, in the valleys of the Arnon, and the slope of the valleys that extends to the seat of Ar, and leans to the border of Moab. Now, this is taken from the book of the walls of the Lord, books of the walls of Yahweh. Now, first of all, it's a mosaic in the sense that it is the author of Numbers quoting a source called Book of the Wars of the Lord. Now, you know what I mean? All right, that means that it's a different book, a separate book out there called the Book of the Wars of Yahweh. And there is a, a, a poem in that book that the author of Numbers quotes from. An existing book that was written before Numbers. Does that make sense? Okay, he's quoting from a source. Is that in your Bible? You're looking like as though it's not. It's so... <laughs> yeah. So, is it the books of the walls of Yahweh? Is that is that what we have? Okay. So, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, it is a mosaic in the sense that this poem would not have originated from Moses, right? You know what I mean? Uh, it will be originated from whoever wrote the books of the book of the walls of Yahweh. That's number one. But it is possibly also post mosaic, most likely post mosaic, in the sense that the book of the walls of the Lord would make sense during the time of Joshua or after the conquest of Joshua to record the walls of <laughs> of Yahweh. Right? The walls of Yahweh. When did that happen? These places, of course, you don't know where these places are, but this will be very relevant in the Joshua conquest, how the the, the places they conquered, <laughs> right? In, in the book of Joshua. Yeah. So the books of the wars of Yahweh, probably a record of Joshua's battles, um, leading the Israelites and now made it into, therefore it is said, uh, expecting people to know the book of the wars of Yahweh. And he said, well, is that then well, is that Bible then? You know? So sometimes it is like that. Um, for example, the book of Jude, Second Peter, quotes from uh quotes from what? You know? Can I remember? The book of Enoch, right? <laughs> right, yeah, my Genesis class. The book of the book of Jonah, uh, the book of Jonah, the book of Jude and Second and Peter quotes from um uh, uh, uh the book of Enoch. Now, and the book of Enoch, we do have that book of Enoch in its entirety. So then people will be people often ask, well, is should that be in the Bible? Should that in the Bible? I said, just because an author of scripture quotes it doesn't mean that it ought to be in the Bible. Now, it so happened that we have the book of Enoch. And it also so happened that we no longer have the book of the wars of Yahweh. Neither should be in the Bible because, like I said, the Bible that we have right now is exactly what the Lord wants us to have as his word. Just that the Bible doesn't drop from the sky. All right, it went through a process of progressive revelation. You, you see, okay. So even if it, we one day find in, in archaeology, right, a scroll and is the book of the walls of Yahweh, we find these verses, the rest of it 
would not be what God wants us to have as scripture. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Here's another one. Exodus 24 verse 7. Then Moses took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And we will be obedient. Now, if I were to ask people what is the book of the covenant, uh, without the context, without reference to Exodus 24 verse 7, many would probably say the book of Deuteronomy, right? The book of Deuteronomy would be the book of the covenant. Well, it could not have been Deuteronomy then because Deuteronomy is what? Uh, when Moses was about to die. This is Exodus <laughs> 24, right? So, uh, which means that there is a book of the covenant uh, that Moses was reading in the hearing of the people in Exodus 24 verse 7. So, um, because of these post mosaic stuff and a mosaic stuff and the, um, of course, um, many uh, readers of the Bible would stick with the traditional attribution of authorship. Uh, why not? Uh, but of course, you can also understand if there would be scholars who say, "Wait a minute, let's let's take, let's take a closer look." Right? After all, Moses never said I, he wrote Genesis. You know what I mean? And the book of Genesis doesn't say it's written by Moses or, or something like that. So uh, scholars, especially in the 19th century, begin to ask these type of questions and develop various hypotheses. One of the most, the most famous hypothesis or most influential hypothesis is called the documentary hypothesis, also known as JEDP. Um, uh, <clears throat> Proposed by the, the hypothesis is proposed by Verhausen, and Verhausen, um, uh, he thinks that the Torah comes from four sources. That means Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, instead of written by Moses, he believes that that the it comes from four sources, which we call J E D P. Uh, J stands for Yah Yahweh Yahweh. Why not? Why? Because it's German. <laughs> right? Because it's German, so it's J. J is pronounced as Yah, like we, you say Hallelujah, we don't say Hallelujah. <laughs> right? So, Hallelujah with the J. So, Yahwist source, Elohist source, Deuteronomic or Deuteronomist source. I prefer to call it Deuteronomic than Deuteronomist. Uh, and you say, whoa, what did Verhausen say? What Verhausen wrote in German. I can translate it however I want it to translate. <laughs> Deuteronomic source and also priestly source. He thinks that there were actually four separate documents. One is the Yahweh document. One is the Elohim document. One is the Deuteronomy document. And the other one is a document written by priests. And somehow these four documents got fused together and edited into the Torah, all right? That is his theory. Um, so on the Yahwist source, why is it called the Yahwist source is um, God is addressed as Yahweh. So when you find a passage where God is addressed as Yahweh, then uh, that would be uh, attributed to the Yahwist source. Take, for example, Genesis chapter 1 versus Genesis chapter 2. You open Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You have it, right? It, and the earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. So, uh, the divine... Deity here is called God. God, right? Not Yahweh. Okay? Yeah, where, huh? Yeah, Elohim. Yeah, God, Elohim. So, all through chapter 1 to chapter 2, verse 3, uh, which is one creation story, <clears throat> the, div the deity is called Elohim or God. Then when you go to chapter 2, verse 4, which is a distinct creation account, right? Which is like a second creation account. Chapter 4, 
chapter 2 verse 4 begin with these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created right so it's a another story um in the day that yahweh elohim made the earth and the heavens so yahweh first appears in chapter 2 verse 4 and in this story of chapter 2 that leads to the Garden of Eden, and then the fall from the Garden of Eden, is all God is known as the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim. So, Yahweh. So, Valhausen would say that Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, that creation story and that Eden story is... of the Yahweh source. That means there was a Yahweh religion that was worshipped by King David, King Solomon. And it is very anthropomorphic, meaning to say that uh, God walks. It's very... God, God seems to be very human-like. All right? God seems to have human attributes. He has eyes. He has legs. He has hands. He has... Right? He walks, he talks, he speaks, you can hear him, right? All that kind of thing. He asks the question, where are you? As though he doesn't know. You know, that, that kind of that kind of a thing. Um <clears throat> so the Hausen say that this Yahweh source was probably the religion of East of Southern Judah of Israel, with its capital in Jerusalem, its temple in Jerusalem, the temple of Yahweh. Right, so this source must have originated from there. So the United Kingdom of King Saul and King David and King Solomon, tenth or ninth century BC. That is his hypothesis. Yes. Oh yeah, absolutely not. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that 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 is his point. Four different sources, four different documents. <laughs> documents. Who knows? Whoever was in this era, King David era, yeah, because this is a Yahweh source. Yahweh here is God, right? And where is Yahweh worshipped in the temple in Jerusalem, right? So Jerusalem is the cult center of 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 Yahweh religion, uh, Yahweh worship. And so they would have the tax of creation, etc., all of that. And those would be that would be Genesis chapter 2, verse 4 onwards, something like that. All right. Worship in southern Judah. Now, then Genesis chapter 1, where God is addressed as Elohim, this is called the Elohist source. Um, so whereby we don't want to be so specific. Yahweh, we want to have a more generic term, Elohim, which means God, or even the gods. Elohim, after all, is plural. All right? It could mean God, it could mean the gods. And that will be very consistent with the religion that Jeroboam wanted to set up. Right? With one temple in Bethel and another temple in Dan, so that nobody would go down to uh, Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is a center of Yahweh worship. You see? So we still want to talk about the one true God, but we don't want to use the name Yahweh. We use the name Elohim to, to in a more broader, more generous, more enlightened, if you think, in terms of that, right? More whereas the Yahweh's will be more, more restrictive. We only Yahweh, 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 Yahweh. When we talk about Elohim, we talk about God. You, you know what I mean? So if, if you if you if you hear somebody uh, preach a sermon, and he keeps talking God, 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 and never mentioned Jesus once. You know? And God is spoken of in the abstract. You, you, you know what I mean? Right? So that seems to be a more, you know, uh, a bit more liberal, right? With his... With his. So, so um, scholars would think that the line of David are generally more um, narrow-minded, uh, being Yahweh, many of them are Yah Yahweh onlyists, right? Whereas in the north, um, of course, those who are loyal to Yahweh, who wrote first and second kings, would keep on saying there were bad kings, there were bad kings, there were bad kings because they were not following in the ways of Yahweh. They were following after the ways of Jeroboam. 
But the way of Jeroboam is the way of um, pluralism. And we enjoy now the 21st century, 20th century living in the pluralistic society, right? Where everybody gets to worship whatever they want to worship, isn't it? Uh, no compulsion in religion. So by setting up two uh, tem temples, one in Bethel, Bethel, house of El, house of Elohim, house of God, <laughs> right? So whereas Yerushalayim, the yeah, yeah, that yeah, the yeah, 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 that have a bit of Yahwehism in it, kinda, not sure. Okay. Not not too certain about that. But um uh Bethel, house of God, and then and there they worship the golden calf as well. Together with Yahweh, they worship the golden calf. And it is a bit more metropolitan, if you think about that, a bit um a bit more interaction with the cultures, surrounding cultures. So Valhausen will attribute these type of texts where God is referred to as Elohim to northern Israel, perhaps in the 8th century, Jeroboam onwards. So he thinks that Jeroboam and his allies would have been responsible for these texts. And those and that would be a more religious and moralistic concerns. And so Valhausen thinks that Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, and chapter 3, and chapter 4, right? That holds the whole the whole block of story of Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, the Garden of Eden, etc., where God walks with human beings and, and would have been a Yahwist source, all right. Whereas Genesis chapter 1, all right, whereby God is a bit more transcendental. Right, okay, it will be more transcendental and more generic, more universal God. Uh, that will the Hausen will assign it to the Elohists. So he thinks that these two were sibling religions, but then um uh eventually charted their own path because they're two different countries. Okay, one will be more Yahweh centric, another one will be more Elohist centric, and then at some point, somebody fused these two together. So that now you have Genesis 1 to chapter 2, verse 3 as the first creation story, as the northern Israel creation story, and chapter 2, verse 4 onwards as a southern Judah creation story. Because we're trying to build a, 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 a fuse together our identity. So let's fuse together our religion to create a single text. Is No, 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 no. But that Yahweh is not found in chapter one. That's his point. So whenever God is referred to as to Elohim, the Hausen would say that that well, that is Elohist, right? When God is referred to as Yahweh, ah, uh, that must be Yahwehist. That is his idea. Hot pot, hot pot, hot pot, hot pot, hot pot. Uh, at, at certain yeah, certain narratives, uh, Joseph narratives would have been mostly um, uh, Elohim, isn't it? Uh, no, there's also Yahweh. No. So um, so you have to see that when you see how God is mentioned. If God is mentioned as the Lord, then yeah. that will be Yahweh. Then then they will assign that to the Yahwist. If it is um, uh, and, and they'll say that will be Southern Judah, uh, provenance. And if God is referred to as God, then that would be of a northern Israel provenance. Something like that. Yep, go ahead. Yep. L O R D is that Yahweh. That means Yahweh. L capital letter L O R D, right? Uh, no, no, no God with it. That is even more. So you can argue that if it is Yahweh only, where Elohim is not even mentioned at all. God is not the it's just the Lord, right? Then that would be strictly Yahwist. If it is Elohim, God only, all right, then that would be strictly Elohist. When you see the Lord God, right, then that is the work of an editor who fused these two sources together. Yeah. So that is what Valhausen thinks. I can't say this is what Valhausen thinks, right? right? Not at all what Stephen Fong thinks, right? As I'm just telling you, right? So, um, cool. Can you follow? Yep. Mm. 
why do you think there is certain passages, mm. there is the Yahwist uh, approach, mm. and there are certain passages, there is the Elohist approach? Because the, the Hausen, what what, what the Hausen says, is it? I'm, I'm, I'm no, not commenting uh, no, what the Hausen. No, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm asking, uh, 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 Probably your your opinion, me, me. yeah, yeah, not me. Wenhausen, uh, Wellhausen. Uh, why, 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 why should there be a difference? Uh, as I say, certain passages it is Yahweh, and why certain passages is Elohim, especially yeah. in Genesis chapter one, we are talking about, um, the the creation, the create, the creator God. Why should we not say it is Yahweh? the one and only God and instead we use the Elohim, the more generic God, uh, which to me, it may have diluted the um, the 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 I, I don't know, diluted the, the importance or, 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 or whatever, or the, the, the power of God, the authority of God. Does it for me? It doesn't do anything of that sort for I me. Mean, uh. If it is a generic God, it's, yeah. it's, it's so generic. It's, it's not like one this point part, source. This specific God, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. What, because we believe there's only one God. Yeah. Correct? Yes. So shouldn't it be just the Yahweh who created rather than it's like a, a very general God that to me that diluted his supremacy? Oh yeah, in 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 a sense, you you can think of it uh that way. In fact, I would even go one step further and throw the spanner in the works. Uh, the word Elohim, uh, like the English word God, G O D, right now. Remember, in Hebrew, we don't have a capital letter system, uppercase system, lowercase system, right? So if I write the English word capital G O D, you're thinking about if I write small letter G-O-D, you're thinking about something else, right? <clears throat> but in Hebrew and in most languages, there isn't that kind of a of a, of a distinction. Uh, and furthermore, Elohim is in the plural, which can be translated as the gods. <laughs> okay. So, and then in the Bible, many kinds of things are called Elohim. Uh, Yahweh is Elohim. The Lord, He is God, right? Yahweh, He is Elohim. Yahweh is Elohim. Um, angels are called Elohim. Um, the spirit of Samuel, whom the witch conjured, the necromancer conjured, right, is called Elohim. Um, so Elohim is basically a spirit being. A spirit being, right? So angels will be called Elohim or sons of Elohim, sons of God. Uh, sons of God and God, lah, gods, lah, right? And the gods. <clears throat> and enemy gods, idols, right, are also called gods, Elohim, right? So <clears throat> basically, anything that is not this worldly, right? Yeah, creatures or creatures, beings, right? That is not this worldly, this earthly, in the Bible, it's called Elohim. And it's only context that tells us whether we're talking about angels or are we talking about the Elohim? Because Yahweh is also a spirit being. You know what I mean? So Elohim is a category of being, a, a species, a, 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 category, a category of not species, a category of being. So there are many Elohim, but there's only one Yahweh who is the creator. So that would be even more complicated. So um, why did Genesis 1 choose Elohim instead of Yahweh? So Verhausen would say that's because it's from the north. <laughs> if you say Moses write it, then you really would be very strained to find uh uh, the distinction. So maybe you said, nah, there isn't just distinction. Sometimes you just call him Mr. President. Sometimes you just call him 
Joe Biden. <laughs> right? So Joe Biden is the president. Well, president is generic. There have been many presidents, but about the president at this point is Joe Biden, right? So there's nothing wrong calling Joe Biden the president. is stylistic. Um, uh, so that would be what someone who who who, who says single authorship uh, would I imagine that would be the argument that you'll make. Yeah. So is that okay? I'm just saying, telling you what Valhausen thinks right now, okay? So Valhausen also think <laughs> that um, he reads in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 3, 8, 10. And since Deuteronomy was not written by Moses, Valhausen, that he, said, he has already ruled that out for Valhausen. You know what I mean? He has already ruled that out. So then he has to sign, assign an author to the book of Deuteronomy. And he found 2 Kings chapter 22, uh, King Josiah sent Shaphan to the house of Yahweh, which is the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, why the king doesn't go himself is interesting. Uh, why send Shaphan his secretary? Hilkiah, Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan, uh, send Shaphan to the house of the Lord to, to do renovation. Right? To do renovation. To give money to the temple to do renovation. So they were doing the renovation. And Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, in the midst of doing the renovation, I have found the book of the Torah. I have found the book of the Torah in the house of Yahweh. And then Shaphan brought it and read it before the king, and the king heard it. He repented, and then he did the Josiah reforms, right? Which basically tear down the idols and whatnot, and so on and so forth. Okay. So what Second Kings is claiming is that there must have been the book of the law that was in the temple, but has been forgotten that it even existed. All right. And the book of the law, well, virtually all scholars, I haven't heard of an exception, whether they're Christian, non-Christian, evangelical, or otherwise, would say that the book of the law is Deuteronomy. Okay. Deuteronomy, where you pledge soul allegiance to Yahweh. So, um, either during that time, his father was a, was a king that was a, a polytheist king, correct? Uh, and, and so wouldn't have, so may have been lost during his father's time. Uh, and after a generation or two, people forgotten that such a thing even exists, all right? Uh, nobody has ever read it. It become a mythical book, okay? A uh, legendary book. And... Hukia said that I, I found it as I was doing renovation. And then, oh, actually, our religion is Yahweh religion and not and Yahweh only religion. That's what Deuteronomy would say, right? Pledge allegiance to Yahweh alone. So the interpretation by evangelicals, uh, most evangelicals would be that King Josiah uh, found the book, read it, and did his reforms. The house is less sympathetic, <laughs> as you can imagine, right? Uh, the Hausen say that actually King Josiah was looking for a way to unite his country against uh, the enemies. He wanted to assert his own independence. And one way to assert independence is to get rid of the foreign gods because the foreign gods are foreign by virtue of them being gods of other nations. Right? And when the Israelites, when the Jewish people, uh, the Israel, the Judahites worship gods of the other nations, then their allegiance will be towards those other nations. So he wanted to unite the country around Jerusalem's own religion, which is Yahwism. And so he forged Deuteronomy. <laughs> right? He forged Deuteronomy and used the renovation as an excuse to have it found. So basically... Josiah, Shafan, and Hilkiah was putting out the full pony show. How's <laughs> pony show? <laughs> right? Uh, to, oh, we found this ancient text that all of us have forgotten that even existed. What? The book of the law? Moses, thousands of years ago? No wonder we have lost it. All right? For thousands of years, we don't have this book. Now it's found in the, in the temple. Uh, what's in it? Oh, yeah, Israel belongs to Yahweh alone. Let us repent, get rid of the foreign gods, unite the country. His son didn't buy it. Josiah's son didn't buy it. Right? The moment his father, Josiah died, his son said that this whole thing is, I think my dad forged it and so, you know, let's go back to polytheism. 
So that is Verhausen's uh, explanation. Um, uh, so those who hold to the documentary hypothesis would call Deuteronomy a pious fraud. <laughs> what is the basis of the uh, allegation is that the our mosaica, post mosaica stuff in Deuteronomy, okay, makes it impossible for the book of Deuteronomy to be written by Moses. So you have to find a point in time where this book could have been written. And if you, and when he scours the history of Israel, okay, and also we at least we have a text here in 2 Kings 22 where the book of Deuteronomy is found, all right. So, and he makes several assumptions, which are better assumptions than other assumptions that other people make. Everybody has to make some assumptions, okay? So this is the assumption that he makes, and this is his proposal. What do you think? <laughs> so, so, um, so that's where Deuteronomy comes from the time of Josiah. And there are some stuff that is about chronology, about genealogy, about ritual that people would have thrown out, all right, as a result of the exile or even like during the time of when, 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 the, when the temple in Jerusalem was polytheistic, right? They were worshipping Baal, Asherah and whatnot, right? in the temple. That means they said that yes, Yahweh, and we even found like inscriptions and we found um, uh, statues of a, of a male and a female idol, all right, with an inscription, Yahweh and his consort Asherah. That means in these people's religion, all right, Yahweh has a wife called Asherah who rules over the heavens. Like that. Well, if, why do you look surprised? You read, you just read Jeremiah, read Ezekiel. <laughs> okay, so 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 basically, like I said, uh, uh, the religion of the people is quite different, right? This is a minority. This book is written by a minority religion, right? Minority people. So the majority of the people will be will be like that. So why in the world would they keep specifications of how to offer sacrifices to Yahweh in the book of Leviticus, right? When they actually don't practice it. You know what I mean? They wouldn't have maintained that text meticulously. So, Verhausen would say, when did the, 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 the uh, Israelites or the Jewish people begin to really take worshipping Yahweh alone in the temple seriously? Very seriously. Well, during the exile and after the exile. Where these things actually make sense. Okay? So, Verhausen would say there must be a priestly source that is concerned about the chronology because the chronology is important uh, because we want to know who's your father, who's your grandfather, who's your great-grandfather, then we can reassign land to you. Right? Because when you come back from the exile, we need to know who's, which land belongs to who, right? So we need to keep track of the genealogy and who will be the custodian of that. The temple will be the custodian of that. And who runs the temple? The priest. So the priest, the literate class, would have a special interest in maintaining genealogies, chronology, ritual, worship, and law. Because the law is temple-centric, right? So he would say that this is exilic or post-exile, fifth or 4th century BC, and he would assign the Genesis chapter 1, okay, although that is an Elohist text, but then that is such a temple text that the, that the house would even date it even later. All right? I was just using Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 as an example of the difference between Elohim text and Yahweh's text. And here, we are talking about, uh, every time you hear me talk about Genesis 1, that creation story, you always hear me talk about the temple, God building a temple, right? And 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 so they will have been interested in that. 
which means guess what according to Verhausen would be the last last thing that was among the last things that were written in the in in the Torah the Ten Commandments the Ten Commandments would be the last thing that's written among the last things that's written in the Torah because the last source is the priestly source who comes back from the exile and they want to add in their own priestly things and they're interested in ritual, worship, law, observe the Sabbath, okay? those, those kind of a thing. And, and so they would, the Hausen would consider them the final redactor of the Torah. So Ten Commandments would be among the last things that's added to the Bible. And if you ask him, give me your evidence, they say, well, if the Ten Commandments is so important to any time before that, all right, then why doesn't the Bible talk more about the Ten Commandments? Why, you know what I mean? <laughs> all right? Why is it just there in Exodus and in Deuteronomy? but not in the um, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, etc. Never talk about the Ten Commandments. How come? So he said, well, that is because it is added in last. So, from my tone, you could probably guess that I don't quite subscribe <laughs> to Belhausen's uh, JETP. And if I were to, I don't think I can get a job in this church. So... <laughs> Huh? It is called the, document, the documentary hypothesis, uh, awaiting proof, right? Awaiting proof. So, um, I would say a more likely scenario, and you would have heard me say this quite often, that there would have been stories, poems, traditions, documents, for example, the book of Judges, the story of the Judges, they, are, they don't rule over all of Israel, if you read carefully. They rule over their little tribe, you know, their tribal tribal leaders. And the re and these are basically local tribal stories, local tribal hero heroes, right? Folklore, to a certain extent. Uh, and as you can read in the text, it's, it's quite there, very apparent that when the enemy invades one particular area, one particular tribe, the other tribes usually don't care. Right? And the Spirit of the Lord must rush upon Gideon or something like that. He blows the trumpet, then some tribes follow him. Still, some tribes didn't follow him, right? That, that, that kind of a thing. So then, uh, Gideon will be more celebrated in his own tribe. The other tribes don't care about, about this story, right? They're not the one that, that's being affected. So they can imagine that these stories would first surface in their own villages of that of the tribe before it get it, you know. Um some of these stories would have dated back to Moses, I believe, of course. So I would say that Moses had a very important hand, all right, in shaping the the uh, the Torah, because in my mind, I can't understand why must it be the case that anyone but Moses, <laughs> I can't, I can't figure out what is the, what is the motivation right, behind saying that it must be written by anyone other than the people mentioned in the Bible themselves, you know, right? So if Moses were really truly a God's people, then his writing would have been really treasured and valuable to the Israelites, right? A uh, Joshua writing stuff would be valuable to to right and and, and the and the some unknown guy writing stuff maybe wouldn't be as um as influential to the whole nation right so so I believe that many of these things would could can be dated back to Moses and even before Moses where did Moses get these stories from right. Uh, about Abraham, about Isaac, about Jacob, you see. So this must have been their national story, and just that has everybody knows. Everybody knows. It's not. It's not as though people didn't know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob until Moses wrote them. Correct, because Moses went to the Israelites and said that the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me. You know what I mean? You know, it doesn't have to be written down before people knows these kind of things. So um. 
So there's stories, poems, traditions, documents, and there must have been some pre-exilic compilations. <laughs> right? That means David, you know, they would have made some compilations out of these stories. So maybe this tree, which that compilation can be brought during the exile and maybe um, uh, uh, the pre-exilic compilations, maybe a few more. And then during and after the exile, uh, the various compilations are, are made into a bigger comp compilation and maybe taking in more stories, that more, more stories that haven't been added in that's still in the tradition, still in people's cultural memory, but still hasn't just, just haven't been added in. And what we have today is the is the final form. Um, by the time of Ezra, it, it should be that should be it. So that I think is a more logical than to think that somebody feels together two different religions, <laughs> Elohim religion and Really? Well, how 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 do you even manage to do that, right? So, so uh, and, and maintain such a beautiful structure all, all of it. So I I don't think that is the case. I, I think that this might be a more, uh, likely scenario. Okay. So, uh, before we take a break, this is the central the central line narrative, of of the of the Old Testament, uh. That's the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, right? And Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is called the linchpin, the linchpin of, uh, of, of the Bible, linchpin of the Bible, because these books, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, are called Deuteronomistic history or Deuteronomic history. Um, Deuteronomy especially chapter 28, has this blessing and curses. If you obey God, you get these blessings, which is a short list, all right? Kind of like, don't worry about it, God will bless you, all right? And then if you disobey God, these are the curses, <laughs> right? These are the curses. It's like four to one or something like that in terms of length, all right? Very detailed, very graphic. And so, Joshua Judges Samuel Kings is to reflect on Israel's history from the perspective of whether they have been faithful to the covenant in Deuteronomy. If they have been faithful, they will enjoy blessing and abundance. If they have been unfaithful, they will reap uh, the faithful curses of God. Because God is faithful to his covenant, both in his blessing stipulations and in his curse stipulations, right? So Joshua, that's why the the weather is always overcast in these books because they are already in the exile, right? You know what I mean, they are already in the exile, and so the answer is that the answer must be we haven't been faithful to 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 what is stated in Deuteronomy. Remember, these are called former prophets because they're interpreting history from God's point of view, which you, which you talked about, right? Interpreting uh, history from God's perspective. And from God's perspective is that you haven't been faithful to the covenant. That is the explanation of the exile, as opposed to other explanations such as Yahweh lost to Marduk, right? That will be one other explanation, right? Or we just made a political blunder. Uh, but the Prophet's explanation is that we haven't been faithful to the word of God. That is why we end up in exile. And then, so all this in the exile. Now, after you come back from exile, you are rebuilding the country. You need to re, not rewrite history, recast history. You're not rewriting because this, this already is out there. People already know this stuff, all right? So you're not trying to bluff anybody, okay? But you're trying to re recast our history coming back from the exile towards a more glorious future. So First Chronicles and Second Chronicles is way more positive about David, about Solomon, for example. Positive. Uh, for example, when you think about David, all right, think about three main things about David. 
the book. Three main stories about David. David killed Goliath. David, the kingdom. David, all right. And David did what? Bathsheba. Bathsheba, right? You never talk about David's story without talking about Bathsheba, right? Okay? Unless you're the chronicler. He doesn't talk about Bathsheba. <laughs> David was basically flawless. So was Solomon. All right? Uh, it is clearly to, to, to look forward to the coming son of David, the Messiah, who will, will restore the 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 what the golden age right looking back at david and solomon as the golden age of israel and because now we've come back to our own country we're rebuilding the country stop wallowing in our uh, that's why we died that's why we died that's why we die all <laughs> right <laughs> now we've come back to our country let's rebuild our country let's look forward to a more glorious future that is how first and second chronicles uh, recast. Okay, so uh, it's 11 o'clock. We are halfway point. Let's take a 10 minutes break. I will leave that slide on. Yes, okay. 10 minutes break. We come back 11 12.
Oh, you you only need this to add up. Yeah, this is the Yeah, I, 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 I
Oh, no, 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 Does this remind you back of MDS days, is it? <laughs> okay, 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 maybe not. We got recording. <laughs> uh, welcome back, um, everyone. Let me just turn on the video. Uh, uh, of course, you would have questions. Maybe any questions arising from from just now? Yeah, go, go ahead with the microphone. Let let the other uh, uh benefit from the question as well. The microphone is there. No, I was I was quite uh intrigued because oh uh, remember you talk about Yahweh, Yahweh, and then yeah. you talk about Elohim. Yeah. All right, and in the Hebrew Bible, yeah, it is quite distinct. Yes. All right. So I'm just wondering in our translation, like for example, when I read NIV or NLT, does it come out? Yes, yes. This? NIV and NLT absolutely do. Absolutely. Yeah. By like L O R D. L O R D. That would be in caps. In caps. That would be yeah. Yahweh. Or God in caps. God in caps will still be Yahweh. It will still be. Uh, yeah. If God Yahweh in caps, both are Yahweh. The reason why God in has to be God in caps because it is. Um, Adonai Elohim, um, and sometimes uh, Adonai Adonai the Lord God. Sometimes so 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 whenever it is in caps, all right, uh, uh, it will be Yahweh. It is translating for Yahweh, yeah, mm. uh, in small caps. That that is the that is the uh, long accepted um, uh, uh, convention. Yeah. Angels, yeah, angels are called Elohim. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. No, that that one would be all kinds of uh, the translators would go all all kind of directions. So it really depends on the translation philosophy. So some of the translation philosophy who who aims for clarity, all right, would probably say angels or divine beings. I think I've seen one that says divine beings. Um, 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 those that say let's be a more literal instead of uh, aims for aims for literalness um, instead of clarity necessarily. We call that um, formal equivalence rather than functional. So the formal equivalence guys, those who are more like word for word literal, uh, some of them do translate as gods. Yeah. So you made him a little lower than, than what? Than the angels, right? But that is, no, that is in Hebrews. Because it will get a little lower than angels that is in Hebrews. Uh, yeah, but in Psalm, Psalm, Psalm 8, all right? In Psalm 8, you will have differences in the translations. I believe the NIV says a little lower than angels. I'm not sure. NIV, check it. Uh, um, Psalm 8, a little lower than what? Can I have the NIV? And Psalm 8. Psalm 8 verse 5. Angels, right? So, uh, huh? 85 says, 84 says. 
heavenly beings. You, you have heavenly beings. So the ASV also says heavenly beings. Do you have a footnote? Do you have a footnote to the heavenly beings? Yes. You have a footnote? What does the footnote say? Yes, God. Other than God. That's all it says. Okay. So I have a footnote here in my... You have a footnote? NLT will say God, capital letter G. God, right? Which is, I think, is absolutely wrong. Uh, we are not a little lower than God. What are you talking about? And you're not respecting Hebrews that says we are a little lower than angels. Yeah. Uh-huh. Elohim, yeah, exactly. That's exactly what is it, what it is. Yeah. God, God's heaven, uh, in he God's heavenly beings will be the ESV translation. And the footnote says, or than God, a little lower than God, the Septuagint, a little lower than the angels. And since the Hebrews, he, the author of Hebrews quotes from the Septuagint, he will have a little lower than the angels. Clearly, the people who translated the Septuagint, Jewish people themselves, when they read, uh, who, who knew Hebrew, <laughs> right? and, uh, uh, and, and knew Greek, and when they were choosing to translate it, verse 5, um, they say, yet you have made him a little lower than the angels, meaning that in this case, Elohim, they understood it to mean angels. And the ESV translator says heavenly beings. The 1984 says heavenly beings. The 2011 would say angels. Yeah. So um, the 2011 NIV uh, chose angels. Same version, no, same version, NIV, all right? So the editor, editorial team of, the translating, translator team of 2011 angels, the translator team of the same version in 1984 says heavenly beings, right? Yeah, so it's a, it's, it's a decision, it's a decision. But none of them are brave enough to really just write what you have normally translated. Yet you have made him a little lower than the gods. <laughs> yeah, would be how 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 I would have translated it. But I can accept heavenly beings. But I cannot accept capital letter G-O-D because that's the NLT, huh? Yeah, no, no, God, God, he means Elohim, Elo as, in, as in the creator God, creator God, yeah, right? Yeah. Huh? ASV. ASV, yeah, yeah, yeah. Eloa. <laughs> okay. Okay. Whew. Okay. <laughs> so it's it's it's, it's uh, uh, being a translator is tough business. All right, it's tough business. You have to make decisions that you don't that you don't have the opportunity to explain. <laughs> so so that is a that you you will get you will get whacked by somebody either way, right? So you just have to choose the poison. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So let's move on to the shape of the old old test old testament. Now, this is our uh, English Bible that we have. All of us probably have something like that, right? So our categories will be here in the yellows, uh, the law, and then from Joshua to Esther, we call that history, right? And then Job. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, we call that poetry. And then we have the prophets, uh, Isaiah, here will be Jeremiah, Ezekiel, so it will be major prophets. And then Hosea onwards, uh, those will be the uh, minor prophets. Right? Okay? So that will be how we categorize it. New Testament is a different category. Now, this arrangement follows a Septuagint uh, arrangement. Uh, in, follows the Septuagint arrangement, which is not the arrangement of the Hebrew Bible. I have over here my Hebrew Bible. Uh, I have disciplined myself to read first from the Hebrew Bible before I read from the English. And my Hebrew Bible has a rather different uh, arrangement. You can actually come here to take a look later, all right, of the, of the my Hebrew Bible ends with Second Chronicles. <laughs> okay, as <laughs> a second chronicles, 
And here, and Jesus would have thought that as well. Here is Luke 24, verses 44 to 49. This is Jesus on the road to Emmaus with the two disciples. Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And what is this? This is the scriptures. Right? He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So scriptures is synonymous with the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Does that make sense? So these are the three categories, the law of Moses, that will say, oh, the law of Moses, that will be this. Right? The prophets, that will be this. And the Psalms, that will be this. Oh my goodness, what is, what is this? <laughs> Did Jesus have this? Right? You know what I'm saying? The law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. What happened to this? And what about these other poetry books? Cool? Ah. So, <coughs> so this would be uh, the arrangement of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, the Torah, the law, the Pentateuch, there's a law of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. In the middle section, we have the Nevi'im. The Nevi'im come from Navi. Navi means by a prophet, Nabi. Navi, all right? And uh, the plural, Nevi'im. Anything with im, 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 im is plural, like Elohim, im. Uh, the im is plural. So uh, Nevi'im, with Navi, Nevi'im become plural, the prophets. The prophets divided into two uh, categories. What Martin North calls Deuteronomistic history, I told you what Deuteronomistic history is, uh, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, would be categorized as former prophets. And Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12 minor prophets, all right, uh, Daniel is not considered a prophet. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So this, huh, this will be called the later prophets. Uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12. Daniel will be here. This is called the writings, Ketuvim, from the word, uh, the Malay word with Kitab, all right, which means the writings, Ketuvim, plural writings, Katif, to write. So, and it's Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentation, Ecclesiastes, Esther. I put this in bracket because this is one unit called the Megillot, uh, the, 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 all right, um, to be, to be, to be read in different uh, festivals. <laughs> okay. So then we have Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and end with Chronicles. So these are not considered prophets. Um, these are considered the line line. Now, Jesus says, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. As you can see, in the, the law, there's a law. The prophets, there's the prophet. And in the writings, the, the first book of the writings, the heads of the book of writings is the Psalms. So if you open up a scroll, do you want to know whether this is, is it the Torah scroll? You read whether it's said in the beginning, all right, or is it open up, do you see the Joshua, right? Or do you see the Psalms, right? If you open up the scroll, you see the Psalms, you know that you're in the Ketuvim scroll. So that is why Psalms becomes kind of like the moniker, right? Become the, the, the shorthand way of saying these entire writings. So in Jesus' categorization, uh, people during his time categorizes the Bible and the Hebrew Bible today as well, uh, it is the law, the prophets, and the writings, like this. And if you take the three, the T here, okay, the Tav, the Nun here, the N, and the K here, or Ketuvim, so it's KH, kind of like KH, Ketuvim, and you put them together, you will get P and K. That is why the Old Testament in Hebrew is called the Tanakh. 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 In fact, later you can come here to see, it says Hebrew Bible, and it says Torah, Nevi'im, Vekituvim. The Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. That's how they call it, and short form, Tanakh. 
Yeah, from from right to left. <laughs> Back to front, that term is very imperialistic. Okay, so it's from from right to left. Uh, Chinese. The reason why Chinese and we have time for that. It's it's too fun not to talk about it. Uh, so the Tanakh. Uh, so here's Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. Uh, the T, Kaf. Nun Kaf, so T N K H Tanakh, like that. Okay, so um, uh, why right to left? <laughs> uh, so some cultures, they 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 use scrolls. For so Chinese writing use bamboo, uh, strips and make them into scrolls. Right. So one bamboo strip, another bamboo strip, another bamboo strip. Then you sew them together. Right to make a, a book, a bamboo book, a bamboo strip book. So therefore, you write from top to bottom, according to the bamboo strip, and from right to left. Why? Because writing is right-handed. All right, and as you write, you want to push the scroll this way. As you write, you need to push the scroll this way. If you do from left to right, you have to do it like this. <laughs> okay, you have to do it like this. So therefore, and you have to hold the pen like this because you're writing from right to left. So you smear the ink if you if your hand is down. So cultures that is more like a tablet form, a tablet, all right, like the Babylonians, like the um, uh, 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 um, uh, Egyptians, right, uh, Mongolians, where they write on skin, all right, will be from left to right. <laughs> so it really depends on your 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 writing. Material. <laughs> Anyhow, so uh, Quran Navim Katuvim is this a yeah? Is this a stable? Um, how do we know that this is actually a a unit? Is because of some editorial work that has been done. Here is Joshua chapter one verse eight. So this is Joshua. This is the first book of the Navim, right? And this is Sam. This is. So Joshua chapter 1, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you have good success. Right? That is just so exactly like somewhat, someone. <laughs> right? Blessed is the man who walks in the counsel of the wicked, stands not in the way of sinners, nor sees the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his, on his law he meditates day and night. Right? Meditating on the law of the Lord day and night. Meditating on the law of the Lord day and night. All right. And then what happened? Your, 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 you will be, your way will be prosperous. You will have good success. Then someone talks about being planted as a tree, flourishing, prosperous. <laughs> okay. If you, if you do that. Now, obviously, this Joshua uh, is uh, written first because it's such a coherent story. And someone was at the last. And all some scholars, whether they are evangelical or, uh, uh, or, or critical, okay, uh, will say that Psalm 1 was probably the Psalm that was added last as, as a preface, as a preface uh, to mirror Joshua 1 because the, the, the creators of the Tanakh, the, uh, no, the, the final compilers of the Tanakh wanted to ring bind them together. They can imagine the ring binding here. All right, and then this one would match match over here. All right. Uh, here's another uh evidence. This is Deuteronomy chapter five, verse one. This is the last book of the Torah. Um, chapter five, quite in the beginning. And, and Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules that I speak in your hearing today, and you shall learn them and be careful to do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. All right. So that is. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Here is the end of the 12th. The end of the 12th is Malachi 4 verse 4. Remember the law of my servant Moses. Obviously, there will be Deuteronomy, the statutes and rules that I commanded you, him at Horeb for all Israel. All right. So, turns out Malachi chapter 4 verse 4 wasn't written by Malachi, it was written by the compilers. The last book of the 12th. The last book of the last, the, this is the last words of the Nevi'im. So if you, so sometimes if you read Malachi and then you write, I'm checking, I can understand what Malachi is, is saying. What Malachi is saying, 
Then how come Malachi ends this way in chapter... I mean, shouldn't Malachi end in chapter 4, verse 3? What in the world is chapter 4, verse 4 onwards 4? Uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 4, 5, 6, probably not written by Malachi, but uh, added in by the compilers. to create that ring binding. So there's a ring binding here between the Torah and the Nevi'im. There's a ring binding here between the Nevi'im and the Ketuvim. You're talking about the form of the Old Testament or the form of the Hebrew Bible. Cool? Cool feature? So this is how we kind of know that this is the intended arrangement. <laughs> okay, this is how we know this is the intended arrangement of the people who are responsible for the final form of the Tanakh of the of the Hebrew scriptures. All right. So we have been talking about the Hebrew scriptures. So you read your um Old Testament, right? It, it's in English. You know for a fact that it's not in English. <laughs> it was not originally in English. What language would it have been in? Hebrew, Hebrew, Hebrew. That's why it's called the Hebrew Bible, right? <laughs> Hebrew. Um, can you open your preface to the Bible? Every Bible has a preface to it. Um, and look for something that says translation, textual basis, or something like that in, in your Bible. Is there one? All, all, all Bibles will have it. Uh, at, at the introduction, preface, whatever, in the preface, um, turn it to the place where it says it's for the Old Testament. Okay, for the old. Okay, can can you read for us? Uh, this what version is that? Is that the NIV? This is the this is the NIV. Yeah. Can 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 you read this line for us? Sure. For the Old Testament, the standard Hebrew text, the Masoretic text, as published in the latest edition of Biblia. Hebraica was used throughout. Continue. The Dead Sea Scrolls contain material bearing on an earlier stage of the Hebrew text. Mm -hmm. They were consulted as were the Samaritan Pentateuch and the ancient scribal traditions relating to textual changes. Yeah. Sometimes a variant Hebrew reading in the margin of the Masoretic text was followed in state of the text That's great. Itself. Okay, that is the NIV, is it? What is this? NLT, right? NLT, does it have something like that as well? I'm just telling you that Stephen does, didn't make all these things up and it's important enough for, for uh, the author to, to talk about it. I mean, for, for the translators to talk about it. Right, mm -hmm. so here, the text behind the New Living Translation. Can you read for us this line? This paragraph, the first paragraph. The Old Testament... Uh, well, you have to put nearer to your mouth. Oh. The Old Testament translators use the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Bible as represented in... Biblia, the Biblia Hebraica, Hebraica uh, Stuga Tensia. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, 1977, with its extensive system of textual notes. Okay, skip, skip to this okay. sentence, the translators. Okay. The translators also further... Uh, compared. Compared the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint, Septuagint. And, Septuagint and other Greek manuscripts. Thank you. Right. Uh, anyone has a different translation from the NLT and the... Uh, and 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 the like, all right? So we have the NLT and the NIV, all right. Saying that in the ESV, it says the ESV is. <laughs> you have opportunity to to do that. The 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 ESV is based on the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Bible, as found in Biblia Hebraica Stugatensia. Um. Yeah, that's what he says. <laughs> Biblia, surprise. So, so you will notice that there are three things that all of them will say. They will say Masoretic text. They will say Biblia Hebraica Stugatensia. And they will say the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right? These are the sources 
the textual basis that is used to translate into English. Okay, right? So that's what we're looking at. What in the world is the Masoretic text? So the Masoretic text. Before the Masorets, before, before the Masorets, Masorets is a group of people, I'll talk about them later. During the time of Jesus, according to Josephus, Josephus is a first century historian. He's, he's a, he's, he was a Pharisee, right? So there's no reason why he should lie. He said that there was an official copy of the Tanakh uh, that was placed in the court of the temple during the second temple Judaism period for scribes to make copies. So let's just say you are a Pharisee, a, a scribe, right? There are scribes, the scribes and the Pharisees, okay? Whose job it is to, to copy the Bible. So let's just say you are in this little town called Bethlehem. You are a rabbi of that town. Uh, and your um, Deuteronomy scroll is a bit um, old, right? And, and can't see clearly anymore. Termites have eaten or whatever it is. So then you want to get a fresh copy of Deuteronomy. What you would do then is that you will go to Jerusalem, right? You go to Jerusalem, show your credentials, okay? And go to the temple. And there is a official copy of the Tanakh, the whole, the whole, the, the law, the prophets and the Torah. And you can sit there and copy, 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 one, one version of it, and then you bring home, right? Which means if there is ever an Old Testament that Jesus read, this was it. This is it, the one that is in the temple. Anything that happens before that, you know, but I'm as a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus. When Jesus says everything that is written in the Torah, in the Nevi'im, and in the Tehillim, in, in, in the in the in the Psalms, all right, is about me, right? Then I am very interested, right, in the addition that he had. Does that make sense? Whatever forbears, though, though you know what I mean. David may have something, Moses may have something different, okay? But the one, the final form that is in the temple is the one that is authoritative for me because it was authoritative for Jesus. Cool? <laughs> good enough for Jesus, good enough for me. Signal other. Um, but unfortunately, <laughs> the temple was destroyed in the year 70. And so with it, very few manuscripts from the temple survived the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, of course, the Jewish people continue to copy uh, and distribute among themselves the Hebrew Bible. And they were sent into exile again. Jerusalem was destroyed to various places in Europe, in the Middle East, etc., in, in Northern Africa. And they begin to speak the language of the local culture, right? So after a while, they lost, many of them lost the ability to, to speak the, the mother tongue, okay? Like, <laughs> like many of us here, okay? Lost them after several generations. So a few hundred years later, this is AD 70, first century, between the 7th and the 11th century, um, there was a group of people called the Masorets. This, this is basically, a, you can call it a school uh, whose main business it was to make copies of the scriptures because it's an expensive exercise, right? And... And uh, and so it's a but it's lucrative enough for business, I guess. So they'll draw in students to learn how to read and write, and their job is to copy, so that it can be, it'll be bought by or commissioned more like more commissioned by, um, by uh, synagogues, right? By rich individuals who want to have one one copy in his in his house. And so, therefore, there were the Masorets based in Tiberias, Jerusalem, and Babylonia. This group of people, they follow a very strict set of copying techniques to ensure the accuracy of the copies they made. They, and on every page, they know exactly how many alphabets there ought to be, okay, both uh, and in every line. And every alphabet has a value. Let's just say A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, D is 4. So every page will add up to a, to a, to a, to a total, right? So when the copy, the guy who does the copying is one guy, and then the chief editor, right, will be another guy, 
who whose job it is to see to count all the numbers, right? To see whether it tallies up and to see to spot any mistakes. Because if you make a mistake, it's bad for business, right? It's it's a reputation based uh business. <laughs> okay. So they they follow a very strict set of copying techniques, numbers and everything. Whenever they come to the to certain words that's too holy, they will change the ink. Whenever come to words that are even too holy, they'll take a shower. <laughs> so, so they all, 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 all in order to preserve, to preserve, all right, the uh author, I'm not sure the how many how much of this is true, how much of this is legendary stuff. Okay, but just very strict. Lah. And because they were afraid that people forgotten how to read and how, how to how to say the like how to speak, speak the language. They added vowels. Now, in uh, Hebrew, um, there are no vowels. There's no A E I O U. Okay, it is all consonantal text. If you know the language, you just know how to read it. it okay, because it is very baku. It's very baku. It's a B M. D R P D obviously means daripada. Cannot mean anything else. K P D. The butter, right? That kind of a thing. So actually, you don't actually need vowels to write that language. But because people are for, forgetting how to speak that language, so they invented vowels. But to invent the vowels, you don't want to invent A E I O U separate alphabets, se separate letters, because that would lengthen the Bible, right? More things to write, number one. And then number two, it all the numbers larry. <laughs> all the numbers larry. So what they did was that here's the Masoretic, here's the Masoretic text. They added in all these dots and dashes and dots and whatnot, all right, to the consonants. These are the consonants, all right? And they ordered, added all these dots. All these dots wouldn't have been there during the time of Jesus, all right? Was added in between the seventh and the eleventh century. And they also included scribal annotations in the margins of the pages. Now, what is the earliest complete Masoretic text that we have? That is the Leningrad Codex, 1008. All right. This is the most complete, all right, earliest complete um, uh, 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 Hebrew Bible that we have. Every book all right, is here in the Leningrad Codex. The oldest complete manuscript of the uh, Masoretic text in, in existence. And what you read about, the Biblia Hebraica Stugatensia, so the Masoretic text of, they say, the Masoretic text as represented in the Biblia Hebraica Stugatensia is the standard edition of the Leningrad Codex that is used by modern Bible translations. A new edition, the Biblia Hebraica Quinta, is available already, but there isn't any modern translation that uses it yet. Okay, so... So basically, it is an, uh, a, a scholarly edition of the Leningrad Codex because sometimes it is very hard to tell what this dot, <laughs> did he dot correct? <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Because so scholars debate like what, what does what does these circles mean? How I can write a whole PhD based on it, right? But this is uh, a very legible. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamaim et haaretz. Uh, this is Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Of course, I don't read this. I read, I read it like this now. <laughs> much easier. Computerized. Uh, much easier to read. But that is the Leningrad Codex. This is the Biblia Hebraica Stugatensia. So this is what your, your translators use. Okay? To translate your Hebrew Bible. Does that make sense? Uh, this is the scholarly Hebrew Bible. The modern Hebrew Bible will be something like this. The scholarly edition will have all these uh, footnotes and margins that says that that is basically uh, the Leningrad, the, the, the Masoretic themselves, they added notes to the margins. And so those those notes to the margin, the marginal notes are also reflected. Yeah. Uh, there is, just now someone body read, I think it's, I don't know if it's the NIV or the NLT, that says that Sometimes the marginal notes are preferred over what's in the text, right? I think that's what you write in the NIV. Yeah. So, so sometimes the learning graph says that in the main text is this, this, but the editor think that it should be this. Because the guy who copied it, the guy who copied it is a junior guy. You know what I mean? 
the guy who copied it is a junior guy. He copied, copy, copy. Whatever, whatever the senior guy thinks that the junior guy made a mistake, he can't throw away the whole thing. He will make a marginal note. Like, oh, instead of that, it should have been this. And scholars debate that who is who is right? Is it the junior guy who's right or is it the senior guy who's right about this? And for the NIV translators, after they see this in what the, the Stugatensia guys, uh, Hebra Biblia Hebraica Stugatensia guys have done, uh, they often at various points choose the marginal reading over what is in the main body, believing that this is the senior guy, he makes better sense than the junior guy. The junior guy's text is this is, is the main body, right? So imagine you are the business owner, right? Who own the Masoretic school, copying, copying uh, 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 enterprise. You hire junior guys, isn't it? To, to copy and just go stand there, look around, look around, look around. Then whenever they finish one page, they pass up, then you see, you want to check whether you got correction or not, isn't it? So editor, as an editor, but you cannot just scrub off what they write, okay? You have to, so they, they make their annotation at the margins. So, so that depends. The NIV says, the NIV translator says, for the most part, they follow the, the what is the main, but the, can you read that part again for, 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 for us? Sometimes a variant Hebrew reading, I have to repeat to in the margins of the of the Masoretic text was followed instead of the text itself. Sometimes the translators, the NIV team, all right, make the decision to follow what is in the margins because they believe that that is a senior guy and therefore more likely to be correct than what is in the main body. So when they put the footnote, all right, they will say that in the main body of the Masoretic text, it reads something different, but we have chosen to read this instead. Yeah. A, a different translation team would choose a different. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my Bible will look like that. I don't have the uh, the footnoting and the and the and the, what we call the apparatus. No. Yeah. Yes. Ah, so let's talk. Because what is the problem with this? The problem is that the Masoretic guys, I mean, this is late in the Masoretic history, right? 7th to 11th century, then the Masoretics, top up, and this is like 11th century, early 11th century, right? Close to almost top up already, right? The Masoretic school. So this is like one of the last manuscripts that they have completed. So we are quite confident that what we have in 1008 is quite, the same as what we have in 650, all right? But then, what about between 70 and 650, all right? Too bad. Too bad. We don't have. <laughs> ah. Hebrew Bible and Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles, yeah. You have. It's just a different arrangement. Go, 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 go. What, what? The order is different. The content is exactly the same. Uh, Malachi is here. Yeah. Uh, Haggai, Haggai is here. The twelve. Uh, the Old Testament is the. It has the Hebrew Bible. Yes. The Old Testament contains the Hebrew Bible. Yes. Yeah. All the books, all the the books, just different order. Hmm. This one, uh, this is the Hebrew Bible. Why would they suddenly change to our English Bible? Uh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Leningrad, Leningrad. The Leningrad, uh, Leningrad Codex is what they have. In Hebrew, of course. Of course. Huh? Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh the question is what what about between AD 70 and 650 or 680, whenever that's good start? Uh, we, 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 we don't have much uh, from that. So the question is, can we believe these people? <laughs> can we believe these people? 
as the custodian of God's word, right? So, uh, are they the only witnesses? No, they are not the only witnesses. We have, providentially, the Septuagint, which you also read in your in your in, in your preface, right? The Septuagint is a translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek done by the Jews themselves between 3rd century BC to 132 uh, uh, BC, all right? So between a hundred, more than 100 years before Jesus, the thing was already completed. And, and uh, the reason is because people at the time, they're living in Alexandria, right? They couldn't speak Hebrew anymore. If the whole Bible is in Hebrew, the liturgy is in Hebrew, how are we ever going to understand the Bible? But they're still Jewish, right? Just because you can't speak Chinese anymore doesn't mean you don't celebrate Chinese New Year, give Ang Bao, you still do that. So they're still, they're, they're still Jewish in their culture, in their religion. It's just that they no longer have the Hebrew language. So those who, are, who could speak both languages, the scholars in Alexandria, decided to translate the, 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 the Hebrew Bible into the common language. And so... They, this is in the in the Greek, they call it hey metaphrasis ton hey dome conta, the translation of the 70. 70. So, the, so legend has it that 70 translators translated it and independently and came up with the same. That's legend. Lah. <laughs> okay. And and it is, but it's called the translation of the 70. That's why it's called Septuagint, right? Uh, LXX, that's just the Roman numerals for 70, 50, 10, 10, 70, right? So LX, why is it called, why is Septuagint called LXX? Because 70, all right? So the, yeah, the, Latin ver the Latin name for it is Versio Septuaginta Interpretum. So Septuaginta is the word that becomes Septuagint. And in this translation, they have the four sections that is that corresponds with our that our Hebrew Bible corresponds to, which is law, history, poetry, and prophets. Okay, makes sense. So the Old Testament that we read in English today, the the sequencing follows that of the Septuagint instead of the Hebrew Bible. Okay, so the content is in addition to the Hebrew Bible, since they're going to be translating anyways. Why waste the translators? All right, translate more. So they translated also what is called the Deuterocanonical books, Tobit, Judith, Esther with additions, 1, 2, Maccabees. Uh, Esther additions is the one that I've been studying for seven years now, and I still couldn't make sense of it, but I'll, I'll try. <laughs> I'll try to complete stud my study of Esther next year. So 1, 2, Maccabees, uh, Wisdom of Solomon, Sirach, or Ecclesiasticus, Baruch, Letter of Jeremiah, and Daniel with additions. And Apocrypha books such as Edra 3, 4, Maccabees, Psalm 151, that's prayer of Manasseh and Psalms of Solomon not found in the Hebrew Bible. So some would say this ought to be in the, the Bible and some uh, Christian denominations would have this in the Bible, right? And wow, Protestant Bible, Catholic Bible, why is it different? It is because the uh, Catholic Bible follows the Septuagint. Uh, uh, the Protestant Bible follows the Hebrew Bible uh, in terms of its content. So Stephen, who should I follow? I follow Jesus. Jesus says, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then that's it, <laughs> you know? So, and, and, and so that, that is, I'm, Christ, I'm Christocentric, I'm centered in Christ. So the use of the Septuagint is considered as authoritative by pre-Christian Jews. Uh, Philo, the Jewish philosopher, Josephus, our Pharisee historian, the Qumran community, all right, are uh, all considered, all, yeah, who was probably responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, all considered the Septuagint to be authoritative. So the New Testament writers who themselves were Jewish freely cited the Septuagint and other Greek translations. There are, there are others, have other efforts as well. But mostly when you read the New Testament and then you read, thus it is written, for it is written, or as it is said, right? And then you read the thing and then you compare back with the Old Testament. Hey, how come? So completely different, right? It is because when your translator was translating the Old Testament, they're using the Hebrew Bible. When they are translating the New Testament, they're using the New Testament authors, and the New Testament was quoting from the Septu Septuagint. Right? So by the second century, the Jews abandoned the Septuagint because uh, the Christians are using it too much. <laughs> the Christians are using it too much. 
and using the Septuagint to prove text Christian doctrines such as the virgin birth of Christ, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and and the Jew says, "No, what? Let's forget about the Septuagint altogether. Let's go back to the Hebrew Bible." So today, Jewish uh, people, uh, uh, Judaism, will not recognize the Septuagint as authoritative anymore. Okay, uh, they go back to the Hebrew Bible. Okay, so therefore, now we have an additional data point, right, to compare whether what the Masorets have preserved, you know, was what the Septuagint has translated. You see, you see, and not too bad, not too bad. So from that, we know that the Masoretic guys have done a pretty good job in preserving and they did a good job about what between before them, what happened before them. Well, seems reasonably fine. So we have nothing to go by. We have nothing to go by, all right, all those centuries until after World War II. After World War II, between 1946 to 1956, in this place called the Qumran Caves, you can see these are caves in the mountain, right? In the Qumran Caves, uh, near the Dead Sea, we found uh, jars. After jars, in, inside it has, has scrolls. And, and many of those scrolls are biblical scrolls, okay, that is preserved in a jar. And those scrolls date back to 150 years before Christ. So if there is such a thing, right, as the Bible that Jesus read, you know what I mean? So which is why you say, uh, I think probably yours or yours that says that uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is an earlier form of the Hebrew text, right? Earlier than the Masoretic form. Okay? And so now for the first time in all history, all right, we have, since the World War II onwards, we have evidence of the Hebrew Bible before the Masorets. And that has been incorporated uh, into your translations. And also incorporated into the into the so this is the marginal side and this is the apparatus. So the apparatus, so here is the Leningrad of the Masoretic and then the, the apparatus will tell you well, what does the DC school say? Is this no or, or something like that? What do other Scrolls say. In 1970, in a small village, I'm not sure whether it was a small village, called Angedi, in the synagogue that was burned down, uh, burned down in the, in, in the 4th century, they found a scroll that is dated to 210 to 390. So we're talking about 200 years. But, but because we're answering the question, do we have anything from the year 70 to the, sev to the, six, uh, to the 7th century, right? So we have a scroll that is dated to 210 to 390, excavated in 1970. We, it is basically this. Now we know that this is scripture, has to be because it was in an ark in the synagogue, all right? So we know that this is scripture, but we couldn't open it, we couldn't read it because the moment you open it, 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 it gets destroyed because it's charred, all right? So they, they just kept it until 2016 when they did a CT scan on it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. They did a CT scan on it using microcomputer tomography. Was used to scan parts of the scroll and discover that actually it's the book of Leviticus. And what is in that book of Leviticus matches what the Masorets has preserved for us. So where we have evidence, we have we, we can see that the Masorets have done a very good job. Yeah. Okay. And when we do have evidence, well, well, we should assume based on the evidence that we have, right? That that what we have, my point, my point. So this whole session after two hours, all right, is to say what you have right now, right? The Old Testament was the Bible that Jesus read. Whatever the providence, Moses, la, 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 mosaic, post mosaic, la, 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 we are Christians. We follow Jesus. Whatever is good enough for Jesus, the house, whoever, this or that one, this or that one, right? Who may be right, who may be wrong, nah? okay? Jesus says, this is scripture, all right? He died on the cross, rose for a day. He is God. He said, that's his word. Good enough for him, good enough for us, and we have it. <laughs> that is the point of today's session. All right, let's have some uh, responses. First from uh, people online. I think only Sawing and William is... Uh, available to, to share with us. Maybe William first. 
Oh, okay. Um, a lot to take in, <laughs> like the JEDP theory. Uh, you have to be louder, louder. Hello, hey, with us. Yep, with us. Uh huh. You know, my, my audio got problem. Hello, can yep. you hear? Yes. Yes, we can hear. Can I? Can can hear? Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh. Uh, I have a lot to take in. Uh, I, I didn't learn a lot about the JEDP theory, but you have really gone to great length to explain. Uh, though it is uh, not the easiest thing to learn, uh, but I think it's good to know there is such. Lah. But though we are not aligned to that uh, and more convicted about what Jesus believed, and that will be a good uh, way to look at it. Lah. Okay? That's all I want to say. Okay. Okay. Uh, if you have whatever that you can hear, we heard. Uh, for the rest of it, you can hear from the recording. <laughs> uh, so, so go ahead. Um, a lot to take in today too. Uh, but it has uh, it has helped me uh, That's that's what I would say. You know, and uh, getting the how the Old Testament you know was gathered uh, and incorporating all the new. Dead Sea Scrolls and also the explanation in our uh, Bibles. Mine is the NIV 1984. You know, how to read the translations and how the translators choose which text. I mean, it has been very helpful. Nah. But as usual, I'll probably need to go through the video that is uh, sent out so quickly, at least twice to fully understand, but I really appreciate this session. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm a weird guy. Whenever I look at the Bible I haven't looked at before, the first thing I read is actually the preface <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> to see what exactly they're translating and things like that. I'm sure it's not the thing that you look at for, at first, but that is the main thing I look at at first, the, the, the preface. Yeah. Okay, so let's have uh, people from the floor. Yeah, maybe just, just take the microphone and pass around if if... If that's okay with you. I'm passing the mic around. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I want to thank Stephen for many things that you have enlightened us. Especially when we read, uh, we never bothered about who wrote really true or not. Whether, you know, why you highlight certain verses in the Old Testament that really show that. Well, there's not one person who compiled the book, let's say, of the, the Genesis, even Genesis or any of the Old Testament. And I'm so also very comforted with the latest discovering of what Engedi yeah, uh, scroll, yeah. Uh, scroll, that our Bible is so well preserved. Yeah. Only God can do it. Mm. Thank you, Stephen. Yep. Thank you. Actually, Stephen, the, the information actually blows my mind. But, uh, and thank you for for mentioning uh, how important it is actually to read the preface to the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not as important. It's only useful for, it's only important for nerds like me. No, I, I think it is important. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, when we read books, we, we ought to read the preface. Actually. <laughs> um. But I think one of the things that really struck me is, yes, it was an information overload. But at the end of the day, I agree with you. That was a text that the Lord Jesus read. Mm. If it's good enough for him, it's good enough for all of us. Yeah, whatever the provenance theory is behind it. Yeah. Yes, or in all the theories or, or whatever, you know. I mean, those are very academic stuff. Mm. Um and I think I, I, I said this last week is I think I, I am really convinced and comforted by the fact that the Bible, both new and old, is truly the inspired work of God. Amen. All right. Thank you very much yeah, Stephen, yeah. for, for teaching us all that. Yeah, that's why that is the effect that I hope to, to, to achieve with this. Yeah, I think you have achieved. <laughs> um, and also um, 
the way that you have presented this is uh, interesting. I've heard bits and pieces here and there over the years, but in a very boring way. And I always don't care about the structure and all those. But um, while you were sharing, I was thinking of what Jesus said, you know, mm -hmm. that heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not. But in the way that it's being preserved, that's what he wants us to know, that whatever that's written, yeah. it will be there forever and ever, and it's relevant. And also, you know, not a dog or a iota or a yacht will just drop off mm -hmm. because this is the word. And, you know, it is confirmed by all these scrolls in our later years. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you for making it so interesting. Well, I hope that it has been accessible. Stephen, yep. my question is, doesn't a language change over the years? Yeah. So the understanding from then to now? Yeah, so if you're a modern Hebrew reader, uh, if you're a modern Hebrew speaker, uh, which a language that I learn, right? Um, uh, modern Hebrew, it will the, the Hebrew Bible will sound like the King James Version. Will sound like the King James Version to you today. So what the Hebrew... The, the, the language of the Hebrew Bible uh, to, to, to modern Hebrew speakers will be like what the King James Version sound like to you. But it's the King James Version, not Beowulf. You know what I mean? So if it's Beowulf, then it'll be, uh, you know, it'll, it'll be absolutely un, undecipherable by the modern, modern reader. So if you, if you learn modern Greek and then you read back Biblical Greek, or the, there will be quite a distance. It is almost reading a completely different language altogether. But with the King James Version, even though you learn mo modern English, you are able to capture probably 75% of what is, or even more, of the King James Version, right? You just need to compensate a little, or the D thou nine, right? Okay, just compensate for that, and some language structure thing, and some, some, some slippage in meaning, Right, words meaning of words change since uh Elizabeth time to Elizabethan first the first uh, right to today's time. So um uh, uh you have to compensate for that and it will be it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, so it is still completely understandable, yeah. To a, to a modern Hebrew reader. Yeah. Just that for example, the present tense uh in the modern Hebrew, it's not that it's actually uh, a participle. So, okay, the the biblical participle is the modern present tense. Okay, once you, once you figure that out, okay, then you can compensate. Yep, go ahead. Yep. Uh, last one, uh, last one, uh, last one. It's uh, 12 10 already. Oh, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. Just a small one about the Elohis and the Yahweh. Oh, yeah, so you're, still, you're still there. Okay. It's just, just that. <laughs> I uh, to me I thought it was like the Lord, uh, the Yahweh, uh, is a more personal God. Yeah, yeah, definitely. In that sense yeah. that it's more like okay, it's the God of the, Jew, the God Jews. Jews. Yeah. yeah. I mean that's what I thought. Uh, the uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so usually we'll say uh Yahweh is God's covenantal name. Uh so so that's how People sometimes talk about it. Yahweh is God's covenantal name. Uh, yep. Okay. All right. Um. Let's let's close. Father, we thank you the time that we spent here. A lot of uh, theory, a lot of uh, technicalities, scholarly stuff. Uh. But, uh, the point is that what we have right now is exactly what you want us to read, because Lord Jesus Christ, that is the scripture that you were pointing at, that says. That points to you. So Lord, we want to devour these pages in order to catch a glimpse of who you are, uh, to have a deeper understanding of you, to really know the scriptures, make us wise for salvation. All scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the men and women of God will be complete, equipped for every good work. So send us forth to do the good works that you have called us to do. 
as your new creation masterpiece. So Lord, we thank you very much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, bye-bye, everyone. Thanks, Dewey.